figure skating for stress relief. You can find me on Twitter at Yokai Tenpu. Hi, I'm Carly. I'm an engineering student working on a side figure skating nerd career. You can find me on Twitter at Cyberswan SP. And unfortunately, one of our other hosts, you might remember Danny. She couldn't be here today, but we're going to be presenting some of her personal experiences as a, show, as a skater. Welcome to episode eight of In The Loop. We're glad to have you here. This is our medical corner, and as usual, we're going to start off with some news. So, some of the Junior Grand Prix and Challenger Series lineups have been released. Uh, please refer to our Twitter for more information with the lineups. Yeah, I'm really excited. We have Cha Jun Huan at Autumn Classic, which I'm really excited because I get to see that. <laughs> yeah, me too. Autumn Classic TCC. <laughs> the TCC field trip. Yeah, you can refer to our Twitter for like all the lineups but some important things we have u.s classic autumn classic the full lineup isn't out but skate canada did release their assignments also given the new judging system with the plus five minus five goe the isu has scrapped all the previous world records they've been archived as historic records and so now we'd like to give a brief thanks to our current men's world record holder sota yamamoto oh i'm so excited And then in some happy news, Grant Hochstein and Caroline Zhang got married. Yeah, I saw their photos. Just, Caroline looked so good. Jason Brown was at the wedding looking good in his new hair. Yes, and in some more sad news, Tatsuki Machida has performed his last show at Prince Ice World in Hiroshima. And we're all very, very sad and we will miss him from professional skating. Nina and Carly are a little bit extra sad. <laughs> Wish him well in his research and all that he has to do, but... No, he's, okay, he's still in Japan <laughs> open. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Let's look at to see him, but like, I'll miss his presence. I'm gonna miss his eight minute exhibitions. For more news, make sure to check out our brand new website, inthelowpodcast.com, for a roundup of all the figure skating stories you might have missed, and it's where we'll be posting new stories in the future. He's won the free! No, 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 that's ridiculous. Uh, so just a little bit of overview. Before we start, we just want to say... This episode does not claim to provide any professional medical advice or analysis, but shares insight on injuries from the perspectives of people with related backgrounds. Not all injuries can be covered, so we have chosen select incidents to discuss. While we do our best to ensure our analysis is backed by research and is as accurate as possible, we're open to corrections, so please let us know via Twitter or Tumblr. Uh, And please be aware that we'll be discussing serious injuries and medical details in the episode, which can be triggering for some. All right, so we're going to start off with, you know, detailing some types of injuries. And we have a lot of examples because God knows that we're never running out of injuries in figure skating. So no matter how good you are, ice is still slippery, blades are still sharp, and you will find yourself injured sometime in your figure skating career if you ever decide to strap on a pair of skates. Speaking from personal input... I've been in a pair of skates, I've fallen, I've hurt myself. (laughs) Yeah, I I mean, first time I skated, I fell down on the ice and hit my head. If you take any figure skater and ask them if they've been badly injured in the last year, the answer would most likely be yes. So, let's try this right now. Mariam, you've been a figure skater for a while. Have you had pain anywhere in the past year? Yeah, um, for sure. <laughs> so I've only been skating since last year, but I've still had my share share of like skating pains. I've gotten stitches on my head because I fell like I was trying to spray my friend with ice and just fell on a stupid stop. Um, had to get stitches and because my glasses went into my head, and so I'm never skating with glasses again. Um, another time I fell on a spiral, had pain walking for like three days had cramps because of um, incorrectly fitting boots for like multiple sessions in a row. And I've had to take multiple breaks at the size of the rink just to like uh, take a breather because the cramps would get that bad. And so this is an insert from Danny, but let me just say if you're a figure skater and don't have stitches yet, you will. Ouch. (laughs) It's the truth. Just like accept it right now. So let's start off with ankles and feet, which are, you know, kind of where I assume most injuries are because you put a lot of pressure on your feet. 
So what are exactly are boot problems? What's really going on when your faves talk about boot problems? So stiffness in figure skating boots puts a lot of pressure on the ankle, especially brand new boots that take a while to break in. Pain areas include the ankle bone, the fibula, and the tendon right next to the Achilles on the inside of the ankle. The affected skater may need to change boot manufacturers, put padding around the affected area, and assure good foot and blade placement relating to the boot. Personal input from not a skater, <laughs> my ankles suck, and whenever I put on figure skating boots, um, I always notice how stiff they are, like the rental skates, of course. Oh, yeah. I mean, aren't those made of, like, plastic? So that would probably have a lot to do with it. <laughs> like, the first time I put my skates on, I used to skate with hockey skates. They were so loose around your ankle, but these ones are so stiff that it just causes you cramps um, if you're not used to them at first. So there's definitely a break-in period for every figure skate. Um, and it just depends on, like, the stiffness of the skate itself. Lace bite occurs when pressure is put on the ligaments that connect bones on the lower foot and the shin. And they happen. it happens from improper lacing technique or the material that makes the tongue of the boot, the part that sticks up in between the two sides, isn't supportive enough. Um, so some skaters often have to use special ways of tying their laces to help minimize lace bite pressure. So I've had incorrectly fitting boots for a while. They've been too wide around the ankles. So I've been tying my skates way more tightly than I should have. And over the past year, developed kind of minor inflammation in the part where laces are tied over my ankle. And the skin is so dry to the point where it's like uh, turned brown in a sense. <laughs> so gel pads help, um, but for some people, they only help so much. So the only thing you can do is um, maybe change your lacing technique or just get a whole new different boot if the model doesn't favor you. Um, what's the difference between different types of boots? So like some boots are wider, some boots are narrower, like the standard size is super narrow or the standard size is super wide. So it just depends on your foot and the sizing and you have to get it fit customized. So you can just order boots online, um, no matter how tempting and how cheap, even if they're like half off. But it's in, in the end, it's your ankle and your foot that are important. And you'll be miserable if your boots cause you pain every time that you're like on the ice. Um, so the peroneal muscles around your ankle area, they're relatively weak for competitive figure skaters because the whole time you're skating, your ankle's basically locked in this very tight and stiff boot. And unless you do very specific ankle strength exercises off the ice, like ankle weights, they won't gain any strength while the time you're skating. Oh. Yeah, I can definitely, like, see how that happens because every time I, like, would take all... Like, I've been rental ice skating a lot. <laughs> Me talking about my experiences as if I'm a high-class figure skater. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> I can do a wally jump and I can hold a spiral for three seconds. So there you go. Longer than some people can. <laughs> <laughs> that shade! <laughs> well, every single time I take the boots off, I feel it in my ankles. So, like, I can definitely see how ankle strength exercises can help with that. It's actually kind of similar to, uh, I used to rollerblade, and you use your shin to support yourself a lot. Right. But it would feel like your ankle was actually just very stiff and very tired afterwards because it wasn't actually doing a lot of the work. Yes, exactly. Also, the ligaments in your ankles and knees are only able to withstand about eight times your weight in gravity, and only if the force is vertical instead of horizontal. So when skaters fall sideways really badly... Um, like Yuzuru Hanyu at NHK 2017 or Alexei Krasnjohn, the lateral force can make the ligament much more likely to stretch and tear. That's because they're only supposed to withstand vertical and not like that much lateral force. Yeah, so we also have overuse injuries, which many people might be familiar with. Skaters train very hard, and this puts a lot of repetitive strain on their bodies. The most common stress fractures coming from overuse injuries is a metatarsal stress fracture, which you may have heard of for skaters such as Adam Rippon, Yana Kim, and just this season, Yevgenia Medvedeva. Um, so metatarsals are the bones in your feet. You have five of them. Um, and stress fractures are micro tears in bones that come from either excessive force or repetitive trauma. So overuse is a form of repetitive trauma. Um, according to a study published in 2008, the main risk for stress fractures in skaters is the repetitive landing of jumps with more than run rotation which is most high-level competitive skaters. Um, another risk factor is competing as an adolescent. Um, both adolescents still have a lot of soft tissue in their bones for where, where bones will grow as they get older, and soft tissue is more prone to injury. So yeah, the metatarsals in your feet, you've got two on the sides that are especially prone to injury because skaters, you know, they skate on one edge or the other, not so much a flat blade for both skating and jumps. Um, 
And then female pair skaters also have a relatively high risk for metatarsal stress fractures because when they're thrown, their jumps go really high and they come down with a lot more force on one of the edges. Um, so an example of a metatarsal fracture, Yevgenia fractured her fourth metatarsal just this past year. She ended up eventually having being forced to take time off. The reason for that, I think, it was because her training sessions are so rigorous. So it tarries, like in Terry's rink, they're known for having multiple uh, jump sessions in uh, in a day. Evgenia Medvedeva is known for training sessions of really repeated jumping for consistency. It's a lot more jumping than skaters had to do in the past. So skaters this year, sometimes their coaches might feel uh, it's better to have them do training sessions and they're able to, but your ankles can only hit withstand so much especially if you're training like seven hours a day on the ice which is what Medvedeva does yeah and Nathan Chen has been quoted saying that when she missed a jump in practice she would redo it even up to 10 times in a row until she got it right and it's quite likely that this sort of heavy training can build up until it creates a stress fracture so moving on from stress fractures and overuse injuries one training injury that I was surprised I'd barely heard about regarding figure skating considering all the falls that happened was concussions. We always think about skating injuries as broken ankles or knees, you know, things in your feet, but concussions are actually fairly common. Um, Ashley Wagner has actually spoken on the record about them relatively recently. She said that when she was a teenager, she'd fall a lot. Um, and because of the brain damage, she had a lot of trouble focusing on her performances. She said she felt very lost while she was skating. And she also said that her academic performance suffered. She couldn't do math the same way she used to. Yeah, so definitely has like impact on some areas of the brain, whether that's math, whether that's remembering choreo, that kind of stuff. Um, so another notable case is Joshua Ferris. He's pretty famous for having had some pretty severe concussion incidents. He fell on the quad toe in practice and snapped his head back really hard, like whiplash. Then he fell again, probably due to continued invisible symptoms from the first concussion. And then he hit his head while entering a car, which not skating, but pretty horrible luck, and definitely worse since it came right after two skating concussions. All within three weeks. So he ended up having to retire because he had migraine headaches, his dyslexia got worse, and rink environments became really overstimulating because in a concussion, um, you're sensitive to light, you're sensitive to sound, that kind of stuff, and his was really, really bad. Yeah, and rinks are always so lighted. Yeah. So I can imagine how that can be bad, and it's just a really well-known case, unfortunately. Even spins can contribute to concussions. So we have the case of Lucinda Ra, who was famous for her spins, especially the layback spin. So according to a sports medicine expert, the layback spin is like a centrifuge that you see in the lab, pushing blood into the head really hard. But then when the skater stops spinning, the blood comes rushing back out of the head very quickly. Lucinda said that for years, she felt like she was going to die during her spins and after and during her skates. And doctors eventually realized that she may have been having micro-concussions from her spins for much of her career. Jesus. Yeah. Like, laybacks feel like, kind of like you're doing a headstand. You know how your head feels like that? It feels heavy. It feels like when you get back from the ha- from the handstand, um, all the blood rushes back to your head, so you get dizzy. Yeah, I was going to say, imagine but... she must have felt very lightheaded. Yeah. And over time, it's just a lot. Yeah. And I mean, skaters... I, so ice is just dangerous, but is ice all the same? I mean, it's just like frozen water, right? Wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it is not that all ice is the same. And you can kind of tell this with how the Zamboni will come out and resurface the ice. So there are different kinds of ice and they feel different to skate on. And a really good example is Boston World's 2016. That was bad ice. Oh yeah, it was. Like there was visible puddles you can see. Um, so hard ice is cold and more dense. Soft ice isn't as dense and is usually harder for blades to grip. A skater may be forced to change their technique slightly when skating on a different ice surface, potentially resulting in injuries. Competitions should ideally be held in uniformly sized drinks, Olympic standard size ice drinks, since skaters have specific timings for jumps, but it's not always possible. Like sometimes they have to have competitions in NHL size drinks which are less wide, and while skaters are used to adjusting their programs anyway around the rink, but it's an extra step that uh, could um, deter their concentration. So more importantly though, the temperature changed drastically between the show program and free program at Boston. 
This could have been because there was a lot of people that showed up for it. The rink might have not used to that amount of body heat. It could have affected the ice and made it softer and made more puddles there. It got hotter by like 10 degrees Celsius um, to the point where, yeah, you could see puddles. Skaters had a hard time doing turns because um, they had to like push harder onto the turns to actually make the turns as opposed to hard ice where you can like just make the turns more easily because your blade sinks a little bit when it's when the ice is overly soft so this can affect skaters performance drastically it's like if a running track got all rubbery or it's like running on sand because runners have yeah. a hard time running on sand because they have to push harder because the sand sinks underneath them exactly because figure skating is super repetitive um, it's basically all muscle memory, so your muscles get used to how much you push, and if you have to change it in a short time, it's not really ideal for giving your best performance. Um, another incident I heard about that had really bad ice was 2017 Skate America, uh, the shoulder killer, because, um, you know, Daniel Samoan fell on both his quad toe and his sal cow, and then he popped his shoulder out of the socket and had to withdraw. And then three skaters later, Adam Rippon also dislocated his shoulder during the free skate when he fell on a quad lutz. He tried to stop the fall with his right arm, landed on his left foot, dislocated his right shoulder, but he did pop his shoulder back in to finish his program, like the boss that he is. So, what was up with the ice at Scam anyway? Like, did someone cast dislocated his shoulder as on it? It was also too warm, probably. Like this rink, which is the official USFSA Olympic Training Center, has been there since 1980 for the Lake Placid Olympics. It's used often for skating and hockey tournaments repeatedly, and you'd think that they'd need an upgrade, but it keeps being used heavily and it hasn't been renovated in years, including the cooling system. Uh, also, there were bugs. Bugs? Bugs? Adam had to clear some of them. Ew. <laughs> he got super sassy with the judges, and he um, he had to clear them off just right before his free skate. Um, but at least to the question, if the temperature is such that a bug can survive, is it really good for proper ice conditions? I'd say no. You, know, you never think you'd hear the phrase bugs on a figure skating rink. Oh, yeah. So we've talked a little bit about some of the injuries skaters can get and how they can happen. Um... And of course, skating and injuries are pretty much inevitable, but every skater has different techniques that they use for prevention. Here, however, some of them are pretty common. Here are some of the prevention techniques that we've seen multiple skaters use. Um, for example, skaters often have to learn to fall correctly. Um, if you fall the right way, you can help prevent or at least reduce the extent of potential injuries. Um, beginners in the sport, they're taught to hold their arms close to their bodies and sit into the falls rather than letting themselves really smack hard onto the ice. They have to basically accept that they're falling and catch themselves instead of trying to fight it as it happens. If you don't fall correctly, then you can end up with some pretty dangerous injuries. Yeah, like the first thing they teach you in Learn to Skate is how to fall and just important to really protect your knees and just kind of, yeah, like you said, accept that you're falling and just kind of roll after a jump, pretty much. Um, so Anna Pogorilaya. She had back problems, and she seemed to have issues falling properly. When her jumps go wrong, she's often too tilted or too far forward, so her axis is not straight. This combined with the landing on a stiff knee caused her to slip out from her edge on the landing. Most skaters try and put a hand down to save themselves, but Pogo lets herself collapse after the fall, resulting in a very severe fall, usually on her stomach or her back. Her most recent back injury was actually an old training injury that came back after her really bad fall last year, and she even had to take the season off last year, which made me sad, but... I'm glad she's back, and I hope she's healthy. I heard she's training her triple jumps again, so excited to see her. That's great. Yeah, so another thing that can help with preventing injury is proper equipment. And, we, you know, we talked about boots earlier, but proper blade sharpening so as to not jump on dull edges and not jumping on freshly sharp blades, such as Nathan Chen. He got new blades put on for his free skate in Skate America because he got a nick on his old ones in the short program, and it threw him off on all his jumps because doing the entries and other things is harder with freshly sharpened blades. Yeah, like if you ask most skaters, would you prefer to skate on freshly sharpened blade or dull blades, most would answer dull blades. Just because sharp ones, you have to make them less sharp by skating a lot on them. Um, and the majority of the time you're skating, you're skating on kind of half blades, but yeah, it's way easier to like do your jump entries and stuff on dull edges because they make turns easier and stuff. 
I imagine that sharp edges, like freshly sharpened blade edges, they're almost so sharp that it becomes difficult to control on the ice. Oh yeah, definitely. And if you put like your weight wrong on an edge, even a little bit, it can throw you off. So we talked about earlier with preventing lace bite, but boot design and fit are essential. Elite level figure skaters would get costume boots that fit perfectly and are the right amount of stiffness. Um, heat molding if it doesn't fit properly, making sure to replace boots after they're broken down. What's heat molding? So heat molding is kind of, they take the boots, they put them over your ankle so that, and they tie them, they make sure that's, okay, that's how it should fit. And then they put it in the oven um, and heat it so that it fits exactly. There's no space left. Um, because even like half a centimeter of space can really throw you off in skating, can cause ankle injuries. So okay. yeah. So for example, my own boots are stiffness level 30. I'm still doing single jumps. Nathan's Chen's boots are stiffness level 95. He's doing quads and stuff. Technically, the stiffness level 95 should last Nathan very long, but they didn't at last world championships where they barely lasted three and a half weeks before they broke down. Um, how do you know if a skate is broken down? Like when it's super soft and bendy, especially around the ankle area, and your ankle doesn't feel locked in when you're doing jumps and stuff. So he only had a brand new pair with him at Worlds. So what he did, what chose to do, he didn't want to skate in a brand new pair. Uh, he put a ton of duct tape over his broken skates and just skated like that to mimic stiffness in a way and limit bendiness with the duct tape. So even though the skates were able to withstand the quads, psychologically it's kind of hard to put full trust in your boots if your ankle doesn't feel fully secured when they're broken down. So why didn't Nathan skate on his brand new boots? Like he had them with him, right? I mean, I've, I saw Worlds last spring and I mean, one thing I've learned from that is apparently you're never supposed to skate on new boots. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you had watched the movie Ice Princess, which we discussed in our last episode, you would know that you can't skate on new boots. Casey Carlisle could tell you that. I feel like that came up in I, Tanya also, something about brand new boots. So like if you skate in like brand new boots, you're not able to bend your ankle as much. So if you like try and do some jumps with that level of stiffness, it can throw you off, it can hurt you. And more likely your ankle isn't used to that freshly new stiffness. So you will get cramps, you will get bleeding. Especially like we, show, we saw pictures of his skates where there were blood marks. Um, and that's just typical if you're skating on uh, brand new steep foods, especially a competition. So Nathan and Shoma learned their lesson. Nathan even now has a bunch of boots that he interchanges in practice. So when it's competition time, he has multiple broken in skates in case one of them breaks down completely. So like at the last Olympics, he had three broken in skates so that he wouldn't have to skate with like a completely broken down skate or a completely new st super stiff skate. It's yeah. pretty smart. Yeah. I, yeah, I think that's a good idea. It's what I expect of someone going to Yale. Meh. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> Skaters also do a lot of off ice conditioning to make sure that, you know, just their bodies are generally strong. Um, especially because in figure skating, there's a lot of muscles that skaters use that the average person like me is never going to have to use in their life. Skaters also do a lot of image trading. Um, for example, pairs and ice dance partners will practice their lifts off the ice before they even attempt it on the ice so that they're comfortable with it. And single skaters will generally, you see them sometimes in um, videos of competitions, they practice rotating their jumps off the ice so they can get the rotation before attempting it on ice. Yeah, so it's much, it's important to note that this is easier for some jumps than others. You know, it's easier to rotate a double axle off ice than on ice compared to salcos and loops because you need speed and a good solid edge, which is kind of hard to get on running shoes. Harnesses are available for a skater to get used to rotating on and off the ice. And also, when doing off-ice jumps, skaters are instructed to only jump on rubber surfaces because concrete puts too much stress on their joints. Oh, is that why the off-ice area, like around the rink, is usually made of rubber? Yep, it's always it always has to be made of rubber because it decreases the impact of off-ice jumps. I mean, like you still see skaters doing jumps on concrete to like show off, but I mean, it's a show-off sport, so like <laughs> it's whatever. <laughs> as long as you're not doing it like every single day. So image training. 
also has a psychological dimension. Isuru did a lot of image training, watching his old successful programs and running through his steps to remind himself what his routine should feel like when he was in rehab leading up to the Olympics. So when he wasn't when he wasn't able to be on the ice, he just watched himself um, kind of do the run through in his living room, that kind of stuff, just to get his head um, in that mindset of this is what my program should feel like. Um, something else you might have seen is KT Tape, um, Evgenia Medvedeva wore it at NHK Trophy, Rana Gasu wore KT Tape with the USA print on her thigh at the Pyeongchang. People thought it might have been a tattoo. Um, it's supposed to help support your muscles. Studies aren't quite sure if it has like an actual um, significant effect, but even if it does have a tiny effect, or even if it's a placebo, um, that mental edge can help a skater get on the podium. Yeah, and so there's also things like butt pads and knee pads to protect skaters, like, you know, when trying new jumps, and can help, and it can help them to overcome the mental block of jumps, but not many skate with butt or knee pads at competitions because they spend thousands of dollars on costumes and don't want to ruin their look. See, helmets would also prevent concussions, but one, they don't offer a lot of protection, and two, they would possibly throw the skaters off balance. And three, there's no way the judges would like it if someone wore a big helmet during competitions. Because, again, ugly. This really raises the question of how much emphasis on beauty and performance there is in figure skating, which is not the case with most other sports, and it contributes to increasing risk of injury by making it hard to incorporate protective gear into performance, unfortunately. It reminds yeah. me of cheerleading. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. It really scares me. So now we want to talk a little bit about uh, medical response times, because sometimes when there's really big, drastic incidents, um, you might have seen, you know, the medics run onto the ice. Yeah, so we'll be using two incidents as real-life examples of emergency medical response to see how this protocol is handled in a real-life situation. The collision and the medical response of Kepa China 2014, where Han Yan and Yuzuru Hanyu collided during the five-minute warm-up. And the Paris team Tatiana Totmianina and Maxime Marinin, where he dropped her on a one-handed overhead lift during the 2004 Skate America Free program, and she hit the ice face first and got a concussion. So the question is... When do medics interfere versus just leave the skater as they are? Example, are they instructed to wait five seconds if a skater falls, and if they don't get up right away, head over to them? Because, I mean, you see falls happen all the time in a program, and usually they get right back up. So I know some people have criticized other skaters for not in interfering when others are down, but if a collision or an emergency occurs on the ice, skaters are instructed not to interfere with the person that's down because one, if it's a suspected head spinal injury, the other fellow skaters might be doing more harm than good. For example, telling the skater to get up when if it's a head and spinal injury, they should not move at all. They shouldn't even nod. Um, and two, skaters are used to their peers falling down and laying down for a while. And if they're in competition mode, it's kind of hard to notice things going around you. Yeah, so at Cup of China 2014, it took 30 seconds for the announcers to tell skaters to leave the ice. It's because of the relay system. So the medic tells the timekeeper, who tells the referee, who tells the announcer that the skaters have to leave the ice. So the medics have to wait for that confirmation from the referee in order to go onto the ice. This whole process took 50 seconds in total for the EMS to arrive at Yuzuru's side at Cup of China 2014. With Tatmianana and Marinin, it took about 30 seconds for EMS to get to her. Yeah, so this delay in timing can potentially be interpreted as inattentiveness from the medical personnel. The Eurosport uncle said there was no medical team, but in reality, the personnel were just, they were just following protocol set by the ASU. I mean, still though, if we want the responses to be as instantaneous as possible, wouldn't it be better to leave discretion up to the medical personnel instead of having to wait for the referee's approval? Um, maybe the, the medic could have a radio and then they could radio to the announcer. Um, that would make it faster to get the announcement out and get skaters out of the ice and the medics onto the ice as soon as possible. Yeah, I think that would be good too. Yeah, that's a very good solution. But then we also saw the EMS run onto the ice in boots. Yeah, I noticed they don't wear skates. I mean should they be wearing skates or should skates be available? I mean, I figure it'd be kind of difficult for medics to maneuver in skates, especially if they're not skating trained, but maybe they'd be able to get to, um, like they would have been able to get to Totmianina faster and assess her injury quicker, or maybe there could be like a set of EMS that has skates and then the people who have the big bags of stuff come afterwards. So there have to be two teams ringside at every single ISC competition. 
So this probably wouldn't work because the rink isn't that big. So it wouldn't take that long for the second team to reach them anyway. And the first team won't have time to do that much. Um, and it would be hard to carry their stuff. Uh, especially if you're on skates. Skates would probably be too dangerous, especially if you're having to lift somebody on a spinal board. Protocol in most paramedic services is to instead wear cleats on top of your boots and also helmets so as to not trip and slip while walking on the ice, especially if you're lifting somebody. Um, but in most videos of medics at ISU events, they're not wearing cleats and are trying not to trip on the ice while walking there. EMS, they also have to carry equipment like a spinal board, a cervical heart collar, and resuscitation equipment. So for example, a very heavy oxygen tank as a minimum requirement, which makes it really difficult, slower, and even dangerous for the medics themselves to be moving on the ice without cleats. So ISU, um, we're kind of shocked that the ISU doesn't provide them already, so ISU, please get on that. Yeah, that way they can grip the ice and run over instead of, you see them, they're kind of shuffling along the ice to get to someone. And you see them kind of like wobbling. Yeah, then that shouldn't happen, especially if you have to lift somebody and you only have like four people to do so. And I mean, speaking of lifting people, they don't even... Right now they have to call in for support for a rink side stretcher, but that can be that can actually take kind of a while because they have to get the stretcher and it might not be super easily available. Yeah, so regardless of the severity of the incident, a potentially concussed individual should move as little as possible until the doctors can clear them um, if they've injured this pine or not. So who takes care of medical training and certification? US FSA coaches are encouraged to complete an annual concussion recognition program. But what about the others? Are there ISU guidelines regarding this? In the Cup of China case, uh, there was no official medical doctor on standby to assess either of the athletes. There's, there's supposed to be one doctor at ringside out of the four medics that are on the rink. The doctor that assisted them were from the US FSA and Ski Canada. The people who treated them were the American and Canadian doctors. That's ridiculous. Yeah. So we also see that the EMS didn't stop Yuzuru from trying to stand up and they actually allowed him to keep moving and skate off the ice before being examined by doctors. So shouldn't they have stopped him from moving? Yeah, um, so medics need to keep track of a lot of stuff that could indicate head or spinal injury, like dizziness, and they should find all this stuff while the patient is still on the ground to determine whether they need to immobilize their head and spine before m moving them. So they should ask, did you black out a doll? Do you have pain in your head, neck, or back? Did you see any stars? That kind of thing. And they need to ask that while the patient is still down, um, but Yuzuru, what he did was he kind of got up as they arrived to him, and you see the medic kind of like uh, frantically like telling him something, but Yuzuru skated off right away. So we asked the question, was this enough EMS care, or does it point to issues regarding the culture of injury that surrounds figure skating? And we'll talk a little bit more about the culture of injury. Yeah, because to put it into perspective, the medics did what they could with the resources they had, and they had to follow the protocols that they like have as their job requirement, but we think that there are issues with the protocols themselves. Um, there should be a, some changes in the relay system to instead of maybe, so we think that the priority should be to get the uh, skaters off the ice and have a full medical assessment done as soon as possible. So we think that they should change the order of the relay system, maybe the medic gets first and then goes to the announcer and then the timekeeper and then the referee instead of the medic having to wait for the referee or the announcer to give them, a fo um, to give them the okay. We also think that medics should have new protocols to make the medics safer while they're helping other skaters. Um, for example, in Tomianina's case, there were a lot of people helping lift her, but there have been other cases where you can see that there's not as many people, and if it was like a heavier skater and a medic slipped, then they could drop the injured person, which would be really bad if they had a head or spinal injury. I remember at one soccer game, this person um, broke their leg, their bone was kind of popping out, and the medics put them on a stretcher. It was two medics lifting him. They dropped him. Ooh, oh God. So, like, it's really important to ensure you have proper lifting protocols and you have proper equipment with you. So we've spent a lot of time talking about how figure skaters get injured pretty frequently and how a lot of those injuries, they've had to take time off, take a season, skip a couple comps. 
um, in order to do physical rehabilitation. But what exactly does rehabilitation include? All right, so there's numerous treatment options, and they can all be individualized from skater to skater. The thing that's important is that the skater gets medical help right away after their injury and follows through with that rehabilitation plan that the physiotherapist gives them. So not following through on recovery fully can lead to further injury. Example, Yuzuru Hanyu Pyeongchang took painkillers and skated while still healing from his injury. So he needed extra time after the Olympics. So he needed two months before and three months after for intensive rehabilitation um, to heal his ankle. One of our team members' friends was diagnosed with a stress fracture in her lower back because she advanced too quickly and got her triples in no time and did not keep up with proper off-ice conditioning. The doctor told her that to minimize the risk of her spine falling out of place, she had to stop jumping triples and double axles altogether. She's not an international level figure skater, so she said she's over it, but you can just imagine how devastating it would be for someone that is international and needs those jumps to compete to be told something like that. Yeah, so again, that goes back to overuse and making sure you have proper office conditioning that goes along with your on ice um, jumping and stuff. So sometimes skaters need surgery to go in and repair the torn ligament or to set the broken bones. Um, but there are also plenty of non-surgical treatment options. Um, so for lesser injuries, some common options that people do in rehab will try to get excess tissue fluid moving out of the swollen area and back into body circulation. So there's the pretty standard skaters often use rice. So rest, you can't use the injured limb, obviously. Um, ice to reduce swelling as well as compression. And then you have to elevate it. You put the limb, the injured part of the body, above the heart level to help gravity pull fluid back into the body. Um, but this is standard injury care for even non-skaters. I sprained my foot, or I twisted my ankle one time, um, walking down a hill to final exams, and had to had to rice my foot. I did take the exam though, and I did do well. Oh wow, <laughs> legend! <laughs> Sometimes, if a skater needs immediate pain relief, a physiotherapist may choose to inject their joints with steroids um, or anesthesia, and what that does is reduce swelling, so the pain is alleviated and stiffness in that joint is reduced. Some skaters might also get painkiller injections if they would like to skate injured. So this is what happened to Boyang. He sprained both ankles before Skate America, and to skate on those, to skate on two sprained ankles, he pretty much needed those pain injections. Um, also, trauma with boot issues at Last Worlds, he had to take painkiller injections as well. These are legal and sanctioned. They're just anesthesia, um, nothing to do with steroids. One aspect of rehabilitation after injuries that isn't very frequently discussed is mental rehab. Um, after a traumatic injury, skaters often have a little difficulty moving forward um, without being stressed or anxious whenever they go into the, the situation again. Um, so some skaters speak to psychologists to help them recover and move past the lingering trauma. Um, for example, Caitlin Osman broke her right fibula, one of her shin bones, and she said that she didn't start seeing a sports psychologist until after a year, because she didn't think she needed it, but a year later she realized that she was still having trouble and that the issue was pretty much in her head at that point. Also, the injured skater, it's not always the injured skater who needs help. Um, for example, after Maxim Marinin dropped Totmianina, she said she recovered from her injury easily, um, but he needed a lot of psychological support because he felt really guilty for having dropped her. And like, there's not much she can do in that case as the guy. Uh, and she didn't blame him, but it's just a lot to take psychologically if you're the one that dropped her. Similarly, at the 2007 Four Continents Championships uh, accident during the free skate of the pairs team Jessica Dubay and Bryce Davison, during their side-by-side -side camel spins, his blade clipped her face, cutting her nose and left cheek and opening up a four-inch cut that needed 83 stitches. 83. <laughs> Which is, you know, pretty much a nightmare as is dropping your partner. So both skaters had to get post-traumatic stress counseling after the incident. Davison said he felt guilty for not protecting her and had a lot of trouble focusing whenever he saw her scar. And even on a wider scope, I mean, Maxim Kovtun, he had a lot of trouble skating in the immediate aftermath of the Cup of China collision because he said he was so distracted. He also said it was one big nightmare and he wasn't even directly involved in the incident, just seeing it happen was that traumatic. Yeah. 
So, however, not all coaches seem to recognize the importance of mental health for the skaters. In an episode of Ice Talk in late 2016, Brian Norser said the language barrier is a bit challenging sometimes when it comes to the psychology part of it, because Tracy and I really feel like we have a good handle on that. So the time being, we don't bring any psychologist or anybody because we've had some great education in that and some experience. And so when it comes to that, we take our time to make sure everybody understands each other. Yeah, but you need to you need to have professionals do it. Just having seen a therapist doesn't mean that you are a therapist. Doesn't make you qualified, yeah. So it's weird because, you know, Brian Orser has spoken about using a sports psychologist back in the 80s, as well as in recent interviews, but it was a lot less common back then, so maybe he carries over old attitudes towards mental health in general. Yeah, back then, mental health he said in interviews that he talked to a sports psychologist, and he has also said that he thinks it's important, but he also said back in the 80s, it was very uncommon for him to see a sports psychologist, so there might be right. some lingering attitudes with old coaches or judges or something where they don't see it as something that's worth doing. But it's still irresponsible, even if they're trying to do their best to work with their own skaters. Um, for example, Yuzido Hanyu said that he read a lot of psychology articles about the mental effects of injuries and how to minimize them while recovering before the Olympics, um, but I don't think he ever discussed that he spoke with a psychologist himself. So either he didn't, which is, makes the recovery process more difficult, or if he did, it's not something that skaters can talk about, which is still not a great attitude for the sport. Maybe you could just use Brian's $20 hypnotherapy app. Oh, gosh, the what? <laughs> the hypno- <laughs> Peak performance, you know, the magical dulcet tones of rainforests that they play from a dorky-looking headband, like in that one horror episode of Black Mirror. So these are actually two different products. Peak Performance is a, the hypnotherapist. The headband thing is not a Brian Orser business venture, I hope and pray. <laughs> Apparently, Peak Performance was discontinued in 2016, so I hope that they have worked with more psychologists in the mm-hmm. past two years. I sure hope so, yeah. So next, our next segment is a culture of injury, a.k.a. at the ICU, but they probably wouldn't heal properly. <laughs> So this made me wonder how common it is for skaters to underplay their injuries going into competitions or to just skate through them. One of the key factors is how the ISU structures its qualification and competitions, which places incredible pressure on athletes to compete while injured. Qualification system for a Grand Prix final, missing one Grand Prix takes you completely out of running for the Grand Prix final because you only have two assignments. In Cup of China 2014, user skated despite a horrific list of injuries to his chin, abdomen, and left eye, and sprained right ankle where he could barely breathe or stand just to get to the Grand Prix final that year. God, I just, the first, I, I hadn't watched that video because I didn't want to, um, and then the first time I watched it, I was just like, Oh my god, especially now that I know more about concussion risks, um, when I rewatched it, it's like even putting aside all of the falls on his jumps, the spins, like the spins are really fast and the g-forces, I mean, basically the entire time I was like, Yuzuru, think of your meninges, like, do it for your meninges! <laughs> your meninges are in trouble because he could have, he could have like inflamed them more and made his, and even though he didn't have a concussion, he could have gotten it worse, he could have given yeah. himself one. Or he could have gotten second impact syndrome, where if you have a first head injury and it hasn't recovered properly, you can then get a second injury within a really short time frame. And that can even be fatal because the brain doesn't have time to recover properly. Um, So it it seemed really irresponsible that the judges let him skate. I mean, I know he wanted to, but it's because there's no protocol in the ISU for skaters that have to withdraw from Grand Prix events because of injury and how it affects their placing, their qualification, their points. Um, if there had been such a system in place, like maybe he wouldn't have competed, maybe he would have, but the yeah. ISU needs to figure out how to keep skaters from gambling with their health just to get to the final. Yeah, and like at that time they had a protocol, oh, if you're played for a concussion, you're good to skate, but maybe they should have other guidelines that maybe, like if you have this, this, and this, you're not allowed to skate. So it's like, yeah. It's worth looking into. And it's not just the Grand Prix series. Oh, yeah. So there's also pressure to compete at nationals for Olympic qualification and Olympic spots, and well-known injuries can hurt your selection chances. Yeah, so Ashley Wagner talked about this pressure. She said, going into that Olympic cycle, the last thing you want to have public is a flaw, and a flaw that is not going to go away. 
a well-known injury could worsen your chances of being on the world's Olympic team. And God, skaters don't want that. Yeah, I mean, for example, Daisuke Takahashi, he had to skate injured at the Japanese Nationals in 2013 to qualify for the Sochi Olympic team because the Japan men's field was so deep. If he didn't compete at Nationals, he risked losing his place. Yeah, and Olympics only comes four years, so it's a big deal to the skaters. For Worlds and Olympics, there's a system where the placements of the skaters at Worlds determines how many spots they get for Worlds or the Olympics the following year, if it happens to be Olympics the next year. To base something so important on the performance at a single competition will inevitably lead to skaters pressured to perform, even while injured, because they would lose placements not just for themselves, but also for the teammates. We should investigate the possibilities to award spots based on other criteria, like maybe world standings. Yeah, because world standings give a more comprehensive picture of how skaters are performing over the whole season so it doesn't come down to just one competition. Like Shoma Uno at Worlds 2018, um, when he had the boot issues and his foot really hurt and he had to get the painkiller injections, um, when he got his score, like, he was tearful. He had, like, a tear, like, on his cheek. But the first thing yeah. he did was turn to his coach, Mihoko Higuchi, and ask if they got three spots, um, especially because at the time he was the national champion and he was the highest-ranked Japan man at the competition. So he felt a lot of... He, he probably felt a lot of extra responsibility to place high and hold on to the spots for the next year. God, if that wasn't the most painful moment of my life. I never, <laughs> I never want to see him do that again. Like, Shoma, that was... That was... It physically hurts. <laughs> Another example is Wakaba Higuchi. Um, in her first senior season, she was a last-minute replacement because Satoko Miyahara had to withdraw because of injury. And both Wakaba and Mai Mihara were blamed by online commenters for, quote-unquote, losing the three spots for Japanese ladies because they didn't place high enough. Yeah, the kind of thing can seriously damage you psychologically and really make you lose your motivation and feel so much guilt to compete at next worlds, even if you're injured and stuff. So skaters from smaller federations may also feel pressure to compete while injured, as there isn't necessarily a substitute for them. So... Dennis Ten is a key example, and I feel like I should say, rest in peace. He was very strong, yeah. and this is just another example of how strong yeah. he was. He tore ligaments in his ankles in the off-season before the Olympic season and didn't fully heal, but he still competed at the Olympics, both out of desire for Kazakhstan to have a representative and also personally because he had Korean heritage, and it was important for him to compete. His words after competing were, it's a pity we still don't have a growing generation of men's figure skaters, those who could give me the chance to take a break for at least a year to heal the injuries, which is... That broke my heart. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's horrible. I'm getting chills just hearing that. Like, he made himself skate on torn ligaments just because he wanted to give Kazakhstan a face to look up for because Kazakhstan yeah. doesn't have other men. And that's changing, but it takes a really long time to grow an Olympic-level figure skater. So it's going to take some time, but... Yeah, it's, sad. it's definitely a pressure that they put on themselves or that their country puts mm -hmm. on them. Yeah, so, you know, we also see that there are many instances of programs performed with injuries and that the skater may end up having to take time, more time off the ice than intended. But that is what the skater does. They weigh the risks. If you ask any elite level figure skater whether they felt an intense amount of pain in a part of their body in the past, I guarantee you the response weight would be 100% yes. So no skater is a stranger to pain. They should be able to tell what's a simple overuse injury and what is going to be more complicated and consult with their coaches and medical team. However, there are things that the ISU can do on a systematic level to minimize the skater having to make incredibly hard decisions or gamble with their long-term health. And it's not just um, the skater. It's not just all on the skater's shoulders. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about whether the sport has a culture of injury from both a coaching and training standpoint. For example, after ice dancer Gabriela Papadakis fell and she hit her head during training, she didn't actually receive any testing to see if she had a concussion um, like coaches do in other sports like American football. Um, instead, her coach just told her to go home and rest. But this goes against medical advice about head injuries, which can worsen if not treated in time. And only doctors are allowed to do the return to play assessment and clear whether the patient has or, ha or doesn't have a concussion. Um, it's important for trainers and coaches to direct their students to further medical aid. Otherwise, they're being negligent. I mean, yeah. I mean, I mean, Gabriella actually did have a concussion and had to take time off to recover from yeah, it. Yeah, and the sooner it's recognized, the better the outcome um, and the less risks associated with it. So it's really important to have all coaches trained in concussion recognition. So we also have another case of culture of injury in Alina Zagitova. 
she has Osgood Schlatter's disease, which is an inflammation of the patellar ligament where it rubs against the tibia, another leg bone. So this repeated friction makes extra bone grow, which creates a painful bone lump that exacerbates the rubbing. In a recent interview, Alina said that Ateri Georgievna was j- is telling me that I'll have pains anyway, whether I treat it or not. She then said that she just has to tolerate it because the condition only gets better with rest, and she can't do that. But especially for a young skater, not only does this sort of approach hurt her body, as the irritation never gets a chance to recede, but it also teaches her that injuries are just something to be ignored and worked through, rather than actually dealt with and avoided. And that's just horrible. It hurt me. That's how you end up with skaters who think that when they're injured, the correct approach is to keep going. And then over time, these skaters may become coaches who then tell their students, you have an injury, you're hurt, but that's part of the sport. You just have to keep going. Exactly. It's a really negative and like just a hurtful environment to be in, especially if you don't feel comfortable bringing up the pains you're having, uh, especially if you expect somebody to say in return, oh, it's OK. It's just a part of It's just a part of the sport. Just go through it. Another aspect of coaching that's actually been coming up a lot in basically the past several months is um, whether or not young skaters should be jumping quad jumps, and if so, how should they be training them? Um, For example, there are skaters like Alexandra Trusova. She is attempting three quads, and she's just 13 years old. Um, A lot of people have been discussing whether or not young skaters should be jumping these jumps that are really difficult and anatomically stressful. There are lots of young students who have been training jumping quads in difficult coaching camps, Um, Mm -hmm. but this is but Trusova has been coming up a lot because people know that Atari's camp trains their students very hard, such as Alina and not being allowed to rest her knee, and people are worried that this could exacerbate the risks of jumping quads. Yeah, look, I mean, Atari is kind of known for doing really intense training. Skaters in the past they used to only do two or three run-throughs of programs in a week. Now they do run-throughs dozens of times um, in a day with full jumps and train for five, six hours on the ice instead of what used to be like two or three, according to Daniel Glechinkoff. Because the sport requires a lot more training now as it got harder. You need your triple triples. You need um, hard jumps to be able to competitive. And you need to be able to have way more consistency than they used to have in the past. So the key issue is the lack of research on the effect of these jumps on developing bodies. The only big study we could find was from 2003, so predating the quad revolution. However, that study found that single skaters had a lot more injuries than pairs or ice dance kids who don't do as many jumps and boys had more acute injuries than girls who have easier jumps, so to say. And we've already seen that even just jumping triple jumps can lead to injury. Um, Like Tara Lipinski had to have hip surgery um, and she was really well known for her triple-triple combinations. And there was an article written by sports physicians in 2000 that noted that clinicians are observing an increasing frequency of hip, lower back, and core musculature injuries among skaters. And then it directly said, the female figure skaters who are developing these injuries are typically those performing triple sackas, double and triple axles, and triple loops. So what I'm getting from this is edge jumps should be gone. You're not allowed mm-hmm. to jump. <laughs> figure skating can no longer have jumping. <laughs> Stop jumping for our sake. (laughs) So can we extrapolate from there to quads? It's a little bit tricky, but we have seen that the top skaters who now regularly jump quads seem to have a lot of injuries, and the shift from doubles to triples was already pretty significant. An example of precautions that coaches in general, of course, no no, no coach wants their skater to be injured. I mean, that's just, it's sad. It's bad for the skater's career. It's bad for the skater as a human, human body. Um, so one example of precautions that some coaches are using when, you know, they take kids shopping at Quads R Us is how Brian Orser teaches uh, Stephen Gogolev, one of his students who's 13 and apparently has all his quads. Um, Brian has said that he exercises extra caution with Gogolev and takes into account his growing body. And if Gogolev feels any pain, he um, tells him that he can't jump any quads for a couple weeks until the pain goes away. Um, And I'd I'd really hope that this is a universal approach. Yeah, so like hopefully other teams, including Terry's, do this as well. Based on comments from Daniil, it seems that they do limit the number of tries in one practice and use safety measures like padding and the harness before they even try the quads um, without those things. He says you need to make sure that the athlete is still fresh, they're not tired, then the risk of injury is lower. But we have no idea how they're judging if a skater is ready, so we have no idea what their guidelines are to determine that. 
given the lack of scientific research, especially since the girls have only recently started quads as the age of, like, 11, 12, 13. Yeah, I was going to say, before Trisova, we really only had one quad from a woman, from Mickey Ando. I mean, there are other girls who are training quads, like Gabby Delman has a quad toe, I believe, in practice. But, again, it's so early in the advent of women doing quad jumps that we don't have the research needed to figure out how it affects them. We don't have the research to, fi- to figure out how it affects, like, women's different pelvic structure or really young right. bodies. Right. And I'm sure we'll see some research about this coming out over the next couple of years. Yeah, so with the development of quads, you know, we want to know, should we be thinking about equipment as well? And about how much of figure skating emphasis on aesthetics and traditions, which we've addressed at various points could be hindering both progress and the health of the skaters of the sport. So a little bit on skating boots. Skating boots in general are biomechanically suboptimal. So they lack the ability to flex ankle forces. You land almost flat-footed, which has been shown to cause higher incidence of overuse injuries. May I interject? Um, When you say flat-footed, I assume you mean not on flat edges, but like the arch of their foot is pushed down? Yeah. Okay. I was actually unclear about that. There's evidence to show that correcting the lower extremity biomechanics can prevent overuse injuries, especially as skaters frequently have anomalies of their feet. In the 2003 study, only a quarter of junior skaters wore orthotic inserts that made their boots fit better, even though about 40% they reported foot anomalies. So how has boot technology changed since this was published? Yeah, this was 15 years ago. So in the past, um, in the past like decade and a half, um, for example, in 2007, researchers at the University of Delaware developed a skating boot that hinges at the ankle, so there's a greater range of flexion. Um, but the mm-hmm. boot hasn't really caught on. You don't really see skaters in these flex boots. You usually see them in like traditional, like what Jackson Fly Ideas or something like that. And one researcher, one researcher actually blamed the sport's adherence to tradition. And he said, the biggest concern is the way it looks. The new judging system is supposed to be less focused on aesthetics, but in figure skating, it is the way it is. If a judge doesn't like the music or the costume, then you won't get as high a score. Also, wow at at 2007 being the new judging system. I know. Former Japanese skater Takahiko Kozuka recently developed quad-proof steel blades, which removed the problem of common blades, which are made of three parts welded together. Kozuka said that welded joints can sometimes break from the force of impact on the ice. And so I was really interested when this happened. It's promising to see innovation happening on the equipment, and, and we hope to see more. And it's actually very nice that it came from a skater himself. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure that as a former skater, Kozuka knows what is wrong with boots. He knows what parts of the blade are least comfortable for skaters and how to fix them. Exactly. But it's not just boots where judges are harsh on appearances. It's not just costumes. It's not just protective gear, as we've mentioned. Um, Body types alone are a huge issue in figure skating. We're not going to cover this in extensive detail right now. In fact, we will potentially potentially have a mini-sode on this topic in the future. But for listeners... Um, for the next couple minutes, consider this a blanket trigger warning for a discussion of eating disorders, um, a pretty serious topic in the sport. But again, we're, we don't think that this is nearly enough, enough time to cover the topic in detail. So the thing is, eating disorders actually fuel injuries even worse. Adam Rippon has said that his eating disorder, which he's talked quite openly about, contributed to his fractured foot. Um, with, when skaters don't get the right nutrients, especially skaters at really high levels who are putting a ton of stress on their bodies, using their muscles really intensely, um, they te- it just breaks down the infrastructure of their body. Their bones are weaker, their muscles are weaker, they can't support themselves, as well as, of, of course, their internal organs and other body systems breaking down and their health being greatly at risk. Yeah, so a well-documented case was Akiko Suzuki. Her, so her coach told her to lose weight for her jumps. In just two months after he told her that, she lost nearly a third of her body weight. So she went from 48 kilograms to 32 kilograms. Losing 16 kilograms in two months can put your career and life in danger, pretty much. She ended up developing a severe case of anorexia nervosa and had a really hard time getting her jumps back after she recovered and got treatment for that. Um, What she said was, there were all these younger skaters coming along with good proportions, and I started wishing for longer legs. I got a real complex. So it's just tragic that there's this pressure on skaters to be really thin to have their jumps, and it's definitely another aspect to think about in terms of how the culture around figure skating is. It, It promotes injuries in many ways. 
Yeah. I think, like, to answer the question of is there a culture of injury, we can definitely say yes, unfortunately. Yeah, I mean... As much as it hurts me to say so. I mean, I love the sport, but it's not good for the skaters. Like, there's equipment problems, there's coaching practices, and skater internal... There's internal mindsets that put a lot of pressure on skaters. Train hard, compete while injured. Yeah, some people may glorify people skating injured. But that's really detrimental to the health of the skater, especially if they believe they're expected to skate injured or they're kind of less than what they could be if they decide to take time and heal their injuries. Um, So something should be done about that. We shouldn't glorify injuries. We shouldn't glorify skating injured. We should foster an environment where skaters feel comfortable taking time off to heal injuries and stuff. Honestly, part of me wants to say, like, Everyone just stop skating. No one figure skate anymore. Yeah, everyone stop skating or everyone stop jumping. No more lifts, no more jumps. I would, I'll just watch you do crossovers around the rink. And he's, I think, broken another record here with that free skate. Oh, without a doubt. You know, after our wrap up, we have our shout out of the week. And uh, our shout out of the week goes to not to a lot of hair, it goes to the Toronto Cricket Club, <laughs> who must have had a three for one haircut deal because we have the loss of jason brown's ponytail i'll Aww. miss you oh he looks so he good, looks though. so he's, he's good adorable. So cute. and he yeah. looks so happy and sunny I know. it's a big change yeah. though i'm not used to it it's like he got the post hamilton haircut <laughs> <laughs> he looks so good and he looks happy and then uh gabby daleman she's got her new blondish hair it looks killer dang looks she looks gorgeous. she looks straight fire it's so dramatic we have yevgenia's bangs making a return i believe she said in her instagram post she's so cute and now i'm just picturing like little yevgenia medvedeva with like Aww. little little bangs she looks so cute yeah. they all look so good and i'm a little worried for like the rest of tcc's hair <laughs> i was about to say i haven't seen him i really hope that cha Junhua didn't get a haircut because if jun has a haircut i'm gonna miss the floppy boy oh uh, yeah I Me know, too. his hair is iconic, but I mean, we... Not to mention some other skaters that we haven't seen who better not have shaved their heads. <laughs> Thank you all for listening today. I hope you all will learn some things and there's some new topics to discuss. And we hope to see you again for our next episode, which will be about the first two Junior Grand Prix events of the season, uh, Junior Grand Prix Bratislava and Linz. As we mentioned at the start of the show, we now have our own dedicated website for the podcast. Go to inthelovepodcast.com to see feature articles written by members of our team, weekly news roundups, we've got a full event calendar for the new season with links to information about all the competitions, as well as information about the team itself if you want to get to know us. All that and more are coming at inthelovepodcast.com. If you want to get in touch with us, please feel free to contact us via our website, Twitter at inthelowpodcast, or on Tumblr at inthelowpodcast.tumblr.com. We're on YouTube as well. Just search for In The Loop Podcast, and you'll find our episodes there too. If you enjoy the show and want to help support the team, then please consider making a donation to us at ko-fi.com slash in the low podcast.com. That's K-O hyphen F-I dot com slash in the low podcast. If you're listening on iTunes, please consider leaving a rating and a review if you enjoyed the show. Thanks for listening. This has been Carly, Miriam, Nina. See you soon.